Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The James River is a waterway that begins in the Appalachian Mountains and flows 350 miles to the Chesapeake Bay. It is the longest river in Virginia. Jamestown, Virginia's first colonial capital lies on the James River. The Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the USA. The bay is located in the Mid-Atlantic region. Chesapeake was first thought to mean Great Shellfish Bay. However, the name may have actually meant Great Water, or it might have just referred to a village location at the bay's mouth. The bay is the endpoint of over 150 rivers and streams, with the James River being one of the largest waterways discharging directly into the bay. Eastern Virginia is called Tidewater because the rivers move to the rhythm of the ocean before they finally merge with Chesapeake Bay. The area between the James and York rivers is known simply as the Peninsula, and it's here that our story unfolds. The entire peninsula is rich in history. The mouth of the James River aligns directly with the entrance to Chesapeake Bay from the Atlantic Ocean. As Virginia's longest river, the James enabled the early settlers to explore far inland in search of the fable passage to the wealth of China. Exploration led to settlement, and so the lands along the James River were the first to be colonized. After many years of unsuccessful North American settlements, the English founded the colony of Jamestown in Virginia. The original Jamestown colonists had never intended to grow all of their food. Their plans depended upon trade with the local natives to supply them with food between the arrivals of periodic supply ships from England. Lack of access to fresh water and a severe drought crippled the limited agricultural production of the Virginia colonists. A fleet from England, damaged by a hurricane, arrived months behind schedule with new colonists, but without adequate food supplies. Combined with the lack of trade with the Native Americans and the failure of supply ships, the colony found itself with far too little food for the upcoming winter. An archaeological dig at Jamestown, Virginia, unearthed the remains of a teenage girl whose skull had been butchered, confirmation that early settlers resorted to cannibalism to stave off hunger during the winter of 1609-1610. PBS NewsHour wondered how this exciting discovery alters our understanding of that history. And joining us now is William Kelso, Director of Archaeology at the Jamestown Rediscovery Project. He directed the team that unearthed the young woman's bones and is author of the book, Jamestown, The Buried Truth. Well, thanks for joining us. Now, there have been written accounts of cannibalism in the past, right? So is this something you were specifically looking for? Well, there are written accounts. There are like, actually six from six different people. But they're all very enigmatic, and they're hard to follow. And I personally didn't really believe that they were that true because I thought they were making political statements back to the sponsoring Virginia company to send more supplies. But the fact that we have those, and now we have the forensic evidence and also the archaeological context where we found these remains in, in a layer of soil that we can date to what was called the starving time of 1609, 1610. And as to the evidence, fill in the picture a little bit more that lets you know that it is definitely cannibalism. What are the signs that make this so clear-cut? The marks, the cuts that are on the cranium, the skull, all add up to someone wouldn't make these marks unless they were removing soft tissue and the brain from the skull. And there are just scores of sawing-like cut marks where you know that the only reason that they could be there is to, to remove the flesh. Well, we don't know how the young woman died. What do we know about her? What can be said? Well, we don't know her name. We've named her Jane, as in Jane Doe, to give her some kind of a personality. But we don't know her name because the ships that came in 69 that brought several women, there's not a list of their names. But we can know something from the fact that most of them that came were either the daughters of gentlemen or would be maidservants. 
So what is the significance for you of something like this as you're looking at this long-term project of trying to figure out what happened there? Is this a big surprise? Is this a, a major step to know how serious it was at that time? Yes, that's certainly true, and it had a, quite an impact on me. I, I think that archaeologists can deal with material culture artifacts and get some feeling for the people, but it's when you come face-to-face -face with something like this. In my case, I have a much more of an empathy for the situation they were in and the fact that Jamestown came so close to failing. And I think the course of American history from that point on, from this first permanent English settlement, would have been quite different had it failed. Are we still learning more about what that winter was really like and what a close call it really was? Well, I think so, right off, because there are these accounts that you can take as a grain of salt sometimes. Uh, but now I'm convinced this happened. And to be reduced to that level of starvation is hard for a modern person to even imagine. But I think now we can, because here is conclusive proof, I feel, that that took place. And what's the next step? What's the next thing that you're most concerned to look for? Well, we are still excavating in a cellar room that became a kitchen or a bakery site down below ground. Now, that level, that layer that was of soil that, was, that uh, Jane's remains were found in, of course, that's been excavated, but there's the floor levels of the kitchen. And we just started yesterday and more today uncovering those layers. Now, I don't expect to find more of that situation because the layers above is where we found it. But we can learn a lot about the starving time from what was thrown around in that cellar, and it's a, quite a thick layer. And the, the site is open to the public, and they can see us do these excavations uh, right up front and close. So we're sharing our moment of discovery with the public as we do our research. How many of the growing numbers of dead were cannibalized is unknown. But we don't believe Jane was a lone case. Only in the most desperate of circumstances would the English have turned to cannibalism. It's extremely limited skill in terms of kitchen technique. It is not the result of a butcher, someone that is working at their craft. Instead, what we see is hesitancy, trial, tentativeness, and it is just an absolute total lack of experience. This is not, in terms of the cut marks that you see in some of these unusual places, not the types of cutting that you would see in any type of animal butchering. The person doing this was clearly interested in, based on what would have been accepted cuisine in the 17th century, in cheek meat, muscles of the face, that area, and tongue. And also, in terms of 17th century, traditional cuts would also include the brain. It is possible, just looking at this, and now this is conjecture, it could be that more than one individual is actually involved in this work because, as I say, the person doing the head and face work, they are out of their element, and the person that, if it is a second person that is working on the leg, that is certainly much more in line with conventional practice in terms of animal butchering. There are actually six accounts in the records that there was cannibalism. It ranges from eyewitnesses at the time to hearsay later on in the 17th century. So I think that's essential. I mean, that, that's the background. And, and that was a subject that was debated by historians without this evidence. Now that we have this evidence, it's pretty clear that these accounts were true. Okay, William Kelso on the archaeological discoveries at Jamestown. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.